just describe the story of Looking for Grace. What's the story about? Okay, well, superficially, it's a very simple story. It's about a teenage girl and her best mate, and they run away from home, or we find them and they've already run, run away from home, and they're on a bus to see their favourite band, and they've stolen some money out of their one of them, the main characters, um, Grace, safe, um, out of her father's safe. And then what happens is the parents head off and try and find them and put them back in the car or put, f- try and find her and put, a, put them back into the car and go back home again. But it's told f- from each character's point of view, as you know. Um, and so it's each time you come back to a character, you get a bit more of the jigsaw puzzle and a bit more about what happens in these hapless characters' lives. I wanted to know why you chose that sort of fractured overlapping chapter structure for this film rather than a linear story this film could have just been a linear conventional story and one would argue might have made it an easier viewing experience so why did you deliberately choose this well format? it's a very good question it's probably at the very heart of what i think the film's about which is that i think if you tell it from each character's point of view you get a sort of an ironic and amusing sort of journey with each characters each each one of the characters so for me it's much more about the storytelling than the story itself in the, in the end, it's about how we... And I think that's a big thing about Australian Australians full stop as storytellers. They love a shaggy dog tale. They love that sense of going on a big journey and coming back. And, you know, they love telling you about, you know, how they couldn't park the car today or it rained or whatever it happened. And, and, then, and then you eventually arrive at the point of the story. But part of it is being having the pleasure of being on the journey in the first place. Yes, you do deal with fate and concepts of destiny in this film. Can you just briefly describe the film to us in terms of the themes that you're dealing with? Um, gee, that's a hard question. I guess thematically I'm fascinated with the idea that we all live our lives separately and interconnectedly. But And as, you, and, and as you're living your life, I guess the big question is what's in front of you and you don't really know what that is. And would you do this right now, the way you're doing it, if you knew what was in front of you? And how long have you guys worked on this film? Most of our lives, I think. What do you think? <laughs> Yeah, it feels it's like a long time. It's about ten you years or something. Ages ago. Yeah, okay. about ten years ago on the script, and then maybe three or four years on the financing and making it. Why this movie? Why do you feel it's important to make oh. this movie to get it out? Well, we put it aside in the in the in the middle there for a long time, and then we were looking at projects and working out what we wanted to do next. And I sat down and read the script. I thought, oh well, let's look at you know what we've got in the in the Mix sat down and read the script and I got to the end of it and I thought, oh my God, we've got to make this film. We absolutely have to make this film. Why absolutely have to make this film? Because I, when I read the script, I had this extraordinary emotional experience and at the end of it, I just sat in the chair and I thought, okay, Sue's trying to really grapple with something here, something that's quite... It's quite essential to who she is. Mm-hmm. I can feel that now, now that you know it's a bit since I've read it. And it deserves to be made and it's got to be made. And, you know, I sat there thinking about all sorts of things and feeling like I'd just witnessed an an extraordinary film through reading the script. Yeah, but being what? Let's let's nail this. Oh, being what? Oh, Oh, yeah, let's nail this. Sue, what what, what is she talking about? Do you have a a sort of an an existential view of the world? Is it um, an issue of order versus chaos? And however much we try to order our world chance will always come in and and wreak life-altering changes what is your producer and script editor referring to when she says Um, that yeah no i think you probably nailed it really it is it's a lot about that thing of you know how much will we have in our lives and how much we can actually shape everything that we're trying to do but also there was this something else happening for me which is that i was interested in non-heroic characters and i really wanted to talk about the haplessness of characters and the warmth of characters and have those that particular family on the screen but I just wanted to go back to something Alison said because she said you know she she sat down and she really wanted to make it and you have to see that in the context of Alison being a screenwriter and was prepared to sort of stand aside for a few years and go oh okay we'll make your film then that was a big step for her 
And um, I think that's a really interesting, interesting part of the story. But I really cared about the characters. That was the thing that got me. I uh. one, once I'd stepped back from it and hadn't been reading it and talking about it for ages, as I was reading it, I really cared about what happened to those people and the, how they were all trying. But no matter how much you try in life, you get things wrong. You just do. And yeah. sometimes the more you try, the more you get them wrong. But maybe that's just speaking from personal experience. <laughs> now, how do you get an actor like Richard Roxburgh to break down like that? Oh, he's amazing, isn't he? He's he, extraordinary. He's extraordinary. Story. And he's like, you've never seen him before, I reckon. I think he's so much not like, not like Rake, you know. Um, and some friends of ours have said, oh, I don't know what you've done to Rox. It's terrible, meaning that he's so hapless. And, and you've so, aged him about 10 years too. Oh, I don't know about ageing him so much, but certainly he's, he's come across as a really... Um, He's very funny. He's just very funny. And he's a very funny man, full stop. But I didn't know that he was going to go as far as he did into that character as he did. And are we mean, I mean, there are implications about why he breaks down in that hotel room. Um, are we meant to know exactly why? I mean, I have a theory that it's got something to do with sexual performance. It's, a, it's that colliding with midlife crisis and with guilt about what he's doing to his wife, played I think by Ryder that, Mitchell. I think that's the whole package, you know. But what I love about it is that you don't really know anyhow. You know, that there's that both he and Ryder worked with that concept that you don't have the full story, but you you do have a sort of slightly enigmatic characters that are, you're not you're not having the whole thing hit over the head, you, the head um in the storytelling and in the characterization, they are sort of inviting you into their worlds, but like all of us, they're still remaining slightly mysterious. But, you know, I think he's very funny in the film. I laughed all the way through editing with him. Did you have to teach Rhoda Mitchell how to speak Australian again? No, she's amazing, isn't she? It's incredible. Her accent, I mean, I've, for, she just found that. I mean, she can, she, as you know, speaks with an LA accent now, but... She found a particular pitch of um, um, accent, Australian accent, which was very funny, I thought. Yeah. Now, your film opens What's on the 26th of January, yeah. Australia Day. Who's going to know that it's there? Because we've just come off a very, very good year mm. in Australian film, which came off a lacklustre year in Australian film, which was due largely to lack of marketing of good films. A lot of good films just went in and out of the cinemas because people did not know that they were there. Mm. And one fears that it might be the case with your film. Did your film or does your film have enough marketing behind it, enough publicity behind it, apart from doing things like this, but just billboards and TV commercials? Do you have a campaign? Is there a budget for that? As a filmmaker, you would always want more advertising because that reaches people. And I think, you know, we've certainly seen how walking into a petrol station, which you did with the dressmaker, means you think, oh, I must go and see that. It's on billboards, advertisements everywhere. I mean, you know, and a big social media thing. That was extremely good. And certainly they deserve every... every um, audience member who's gone and seen it and enjoyed it so you'd always want more um did you get what you wanted though in terms of marketing well the thing that's been different about our campaign i think is it started in venice you know and getting into official selection in venice there was a lot of um there was a lot of attention to that at the time and then it was in and platform in toronto which was the first um um how do you call it um, curated program in um, platform in to Toronto where they only took 12 films from all around the world and then we came back here we had uh, we were the opening night film at the uh, St George Cinema in um, Sydney on the harbour the other day with a uh, 2,000 people and a giant screen that came out of the water so I think it's got a lot of momentum from that okay. point of view and it's getting reasonably good press mm. and great reviews from David Stratton and Margaret Pomerantz so that that well, helps it, but like Alison says, you know, we want to be on billboards everywhere. You know, you've got to be on TV and TV, yeah. absolutely. There, there wouldn't be one TV ad to this film, I imagine, is there? Probably not. Probably yeah. not. We're, you know, it's always been batting a, 
above its weight, but mm. you know, whatever that expression is. I can is, you know. Australian filmmakers, you've got to be on TV a month before your movie opens. Do People you? Got to know, oh, that's, this is just my, this is me yeah. imposing my view no, on no. hapless filmmakers. Yeah, But no. you've got to be on TV a month before your movie opens and just have people just know by second nature that your film is coming out. Yeah, yeah. This yep. is what the Americans do. Yep. In their, with their crappy comedy sequels and their stupid horror films, people go see them because they know that they're there. Yeah, it's yeah. Th- I just wanted to just ask you some political questions about women in film. Huh. <laughs> Screen Australia with their, what is it called, gender... Gender matters. The gender Ma- matters policy. Yeah. Is it now policy or is it a proposed policy? No, no, they've got a policy. The policy is that 50%. How much? No, no I think New South Wales. New South so Wales what's, yeah, what's has a target the, of fifty percent. What's the Screen Australia? They've got gender a f- matters five policy. million dollars over three years to sort of augment um, women filmmaking again. Right. So you know we've put, we've been around the block a few times on you this. Have you been, know, yes. so we've seen it in a few different incarnations. We've been in film festivals back in the eighties where people said. Australian women filmmakers are the best in the world. You know, like there was, they could list, you Mm. know, 10 or 20 women filmmakers. And then it slipped again. And now we're seeing all over the world, you know, we're seeing Hollywood, um, England, people like women in particular are getting up and saying, we've had enough, you know, we're not going to take it anymore. We want a bit more equity in this. Um, And, you know, it's about time again. I mean, the statistics aren't very good, are they, anymore? The The statistics, whatever happens or how. So I think it's 12% of films directed by women. I think 2% composed by women. Mm. Um, You know, Elizabeth Drake, if you see her composition in this film, her music is extraordinary. So why is that? You've got to ask yourself, yeah. Should it be a quota-driven or a number-driven crusade or should it be about opportunity and equality of opportunity, basically, that the opportunity to get the finance and to get the film made is there regardless of gender and then talent will establish whether it's majority men or majority women where that literally becomes a side issue and a relevant issue. I'm, I'm looking forward to the day that it's not an issue at all. I'm looking forward to the day you go to the Cannes Film Festival and, you know, 80% of the films are directed by women. You know, everybody would think, oh, that's absurd. But why? It's no more absurd than 80% or 90% directed by men, you know. It should be that the best film and the best people come to the top, like you say. Um, we had no problem with getting, you know the best cinematographer, the best composer happen to be women, no problem. You know, it, but you do need these bursts every now and then that says we need more consciousness about this. We need to be aware of the decisions we're making and we need to notice that the women's stories are not being told. And it's not right that it's only 15%. That that's, that's, doesn't make sense, does C- it? Certainly, hopefully, the success of a film like Dressmaker yeah. which was made by a former colleague of yours, yes. the success of that film and the fact that idiots like me went to see it twice because it's such a great movie yeah. and because they unashamedly described the movie as a chick flick. Yeah. And the fact that it's a female-driven film yeah. would help break that barrier down. Yeah. Success speaks louder than anything. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we've had a lot of success with this so far from people having a look at this and going... Yeah, this is a new way of looking at things. We want to see it.